Okay, welcome to this week's full edition of Outfitter Tales. Um, firstly, thanks very much for all the comments from the short uh, last week. Clearly, a lot of you are interested in the level two growlicking process and little tips and tricks. And that was a clip from um, something I filmed actually a long time ago. So we will bring a, an updated version of that and we will keep putting little bits in and among these, these episodes because clearly that's something that everybody wants to see. So what have we got for you this week? Well, <clears throat> we've got a, a clip which is really a follow-on from the dog training section we did. We're going to bring you um, the progress of Rab's young, two young labs as he sort of develops their training, one for the field game shooting, one for deer. So we're going to bring you that over the coming years, hopefully. But this is uh, really Zosha when I was taking her out into the field. One of, one of the early, early forays into the field where we were actually stalking, um, really concentrating quite a bit on the dog, um, less so on the deer. Uh, an unsuccessful stalk. Um, but anyway, then we come on with the old lad Oscar, show how it's showed you how it's done. So we're going to bring you that. Um, going to just answer a few questions following on from the level two. Gralakin. Um, Alex Mayer asked me about um, notified diseases and the level two process. Uh, but first up, we've got uh, part two of Rab's uh, knife masterclass. He doesn't like calling things masterclass, but he is good at knives. I mean, he, I think he trained as a butcher initially, so he's been around knives a long time, so he does know a bit about them. Um, this is actually recovery of a knife. So when you've not nipped it up and honed it after using it and it's gone a bit beyond the polishing phase as he calls it then this is how to recover the knife so that's coming up first so hope you enjoy it hi guys rob here from talon gear and south Asia stalking uh, this is now the next part of our sort of knife maintenance stroke recovery session so what we're going to go on to is knife recovery Knife recovery, so this is basically when it's just gone too far for you to recover it back using the, the strops as we showed earlier. So what we've got here is one of my, I'm not going to do it by any of my other knives because all my other knives are razor sharp anyway. But what I want to show is obviously the, the effect of maybe just a couple of strops. So this knife here, you can see it's tearing and not actually cutting the paper here. Yeah? Yeah, so it's tearing it. All I'm going to do is with a very, very fine butcher steel. Obviously, you need to, personally, if you're going to be using it on your really expensive knives, get yourself a decent butcher steel. You do get the ones that are diamond coated and stuff, which is great for your sort of kitchen utensils. But if you're, you put, if you're using one of your um, really expensive knives on there, it puts a lot of micro scratches into it. So it actually serrates the edge as opposed to sharpens the edge um, so that it's easy to cut tomatoes and stuff like that. So it's actually a serrated edge. If you can imagine, try to cut a, a tomato with a, a bread knife is actually easier than cutting a tomato with a, a normal knife if it's not sharp. So all it does is put loads of little micro serrations onto it. So you've seen how sharp um, this isn't. Same knife, we've not done any swaps over. So the butcher steel, this one's really, really fine. And all I'm gonna do is, so there's two ways to do this. So the first one is if, with practice and all I'm doing is stroking it down and trying to keep it as flat as possible maintaining the angle of the, the actual cutting edge obviously I've done this for a while so I'm actually quite good at it and I can do it while still looking at the camera but what I would suggest for you guys is you probably see a lot of chefs doing this it's basically turn the, the, the steel upside down and then just do it nice and slowly you're not putting too much pressure onto it, but you want to use the whole, if you, I'm flicking here, I'm getting the whole of the knife. Like so. Right, so let's give that a little test. After just that little bit there, let's see how much difference that's made. So we're still not quite there yet. I deliberately blunted this off on the back of another knife just to show this sort of um, 
comparison here. So I'm just going to quickly do it as I would do it. Obviously, you take the time as much as you need. Just like that. <laughs> Right guys, obviously I was doing that really, really quickly, but it's the same principle. So just maintaining as close to the, the, the angle as possible of the knife. Forward, back, back edge, front edge, back edge, front edge, back edge. That, that gets repeated. The thing people do wrong is they put too much of an angle on it. So, as they, so we're doing this nice and slowly like so. And keeping it nice and flat to the, the, the steel. People get it wrong when they put too much of an angle on it. Yep, that's all you're doing is rolling over the, your, your cutting edge. So nice and, if you notice I'm not, I'm not doing all this sort of stuff. So as I want it to get finer and finer an edge, I just start lightening, lightening off. Work the tip because the tips, the part that goes blunt the quickest usually. And we can just make sure, see, it's gone a bit awry there. Yep, so happy with that guys. What we can then do is then get our strop and finish off the edge. And just get that micro, really, really micro sharp bevel on it. So all this is doing is taking off any rough edges that's been left behind with the steel, putting a polish on it. I'm making a mess here, aren't I? You notice what I'm doing as well is I'm using the whole of the knife when I'm doing this cut. So I'm not just using the one part because if it's just the one part it could be really sharp. I'm actually using the whole of the knife to make sure that there's no chips. So there's a little sort of chip there right at, as you can notice. Right at the end there, there's a little sort of a bit of resistance there. Yeah, so that part of the knife there needs some work. And if we can do a close-up, you can actually see. I'll show you as a close-up, there's actually a little bevel in it where I've been overusing the knife and I've been doing some boning on a, on a deer haunch and that's why we've got that little bit there but everywhere else, razor sharp Happy that guys? Look forward to your next instalment which will be knife sharpening This is not the sharpening, this is knife maintenance the next one will be knife sharpening Cheers guys Okay, so um, I think we probably all learned a bit from that. I was never particularly good. I wouldn't class myself as being brilliant at sharpening a knife now, but um, Rab's sort of pointed me in the right direction, so I uh, I can get a decent edge on my knives now. So hopefully that will that'll steer a few people in the right direction if they're struggling with that. Um, so following on from that now, we've got our... Um, quite a long time ago now, um, a clip I filmed on Gralaking, uh, a subject which is always of interest on these things, so we will keep putting more and more of that out. So here you go, a um, bit of a wintry door, and we're coming into doors now, so a bit of colder weather in store. We brought Zosher out with us today. We're going to do more of a training session than a stalking session, so it's the first... Um, time she'll have been out with the rifle um, so we're just coming out for the last hour and a half of light really but I just want to just settle her down and get her used to so she knows what stalking's all about so we're going into uh, one of the forests and really I'm just going to walk her steadily by the side of us see how she performs and then we're going to lie up somewhere for an hour just get her used to the, the steadiness that's going to be required when she knows what it's all about I don't 
really want a rock steady to heal like I would with a gun dog. I want her to work a little bit in front and it'll take a while for her to understand what that's all about. And she'll be sent in things like woodcock and pheasant and mice and voles and, and deer probably. Um, but once she starts connecting with the shooting aspect of stalking, i.e. I've shot a deer and she's been allowed to recover it a few times, hopefully that'll start to imprint on her. Um, that that's really what I wanted to indicate and I'll get her to ignore most of the other uh, things that are around or I'll certainly be able to identify the sign that she gives me when when she's actually picking deer up which is what Oscar does. Good girl. We didn't manage to get anything with Zosha last night, but one thing we did see, there were a couple of does came out very very late in the distance. It was actually too late to get to them. There's a doe and a follower, um, and a yearling doe, I think. And we found that with this bright moon, um, this time of year, I mean, they've got a long period to feed row at the moment. Well, all deer at the moment, because it's dark for, for a lot of hours, and we've had a really big moon. So we're finding that the traditional times of stalking, um, they've actually finished what they're doing and they're laid up and then you're getting a second movement often sort of mid-morning, mid-morning mid to lunchtime. So we're going to try and beat them at their own game this morning. We're coming out really early and I want to get into a position in the dark and then um, we'll see if we can find one of these, one of these doors just moving around literally just as we've got enough light to shoot. Um, Zosha's at home, we brought the more experienced beastie today, so Oscar's in the truck, so we've got the A team this morning, so we'll see how we get on. The site we're going to actually um, is a wind farm site, but there's a vulnerable uh, restock on it. We're coming up to the Christmas period now, so it's actually quite quiet in terms of um, workmen and maintenance staff, so again, it's a get out nice and early before anybody starts kicking about. Um, Hopefully the, the, the place won't have been disturbed, but again you find that with daylight now um, coming around about 8 o'clock, it's the kind of time when you get workmen pitching in. So again, we've just got that, possibly that first half hour before there's any disturbance at all, um, so that should, should be beneficial for us. Right, so we've just um, got some new batch of gecko ammunition, so I'm going to hide that on the range the other day, which is really good, so we're going to put that in today. Okay, yeah, there's, uh, definitely that's a yearling doe that's just on the bank, it's about 120 yards in front of us. I can't get the shot from here because it's a bit of crap, but to be able to crawl forward is a fairly easy shot. This I can get off a bank in, so it's going to be just over 100 metres. No idea we're here. Wind's perfect. We might have to wait a couple of minutes just to get the light, but I'll tell you what, the benefit of good optics, there's no way that you would see that with anything other than these Sarovskis and the scope as well. If you haven't got the tool that's matching up, there's no way that you'd see that for another 15 minutes. That's what you get when you pay for these things. Anyway, we'll see if we can get this. Sell me a row down there, I can just see the white backside. It's a bit dark still, but let's we'll see what we've got. to let everything settle down for five minutes like the deer completely drifts off i don't like to go straight out to a deer after it's been shot i think we've achieved what we wanted to do um 
got out the car basically and the door ran down in front of the camera so we got quite a nice shot of the door. So we'll do a, a growlock on a tree we've got here and apex predator into use again. The, the binoculars, I'm out every day with the binoculars. It's the quality uh, of image that you get and particularly when you're working in low light levels which we are doing with commonly with, with Rostock in particular. So um, I'm very familiar with Swarovski and uh, we'll continue to use it. Alright, so um, finally what I've got for you, you'll probably gather that Rab's away again, he's on his holidays down in Argyle still, we're still chasing stags around, tells me he's working for a living but anyway I've yet to be convinced, although the weather's not been particularly nice these last couple of days and we've got this mild spell again, wet mild spell, which has just come in here, uh, not really very conducive to uh, encouraging Red and Seeker to rut but anyway, no doubt he will report on his progress when he gets back. So Alex Mayer, basically a lot of people got in touch with me about um, level two and Alex in particular is mentoring a guy um, on his on the journey from level one to level two and he thought people would probably be interested in the process of uh, what happens if you find something wrong or you suspect something's wrong. Well again we're going to cover this in more detail but essentially the primary function of a level two growlick in examination, a level two growlick uh, DMQ, DSC2 we're talking about through the management qualifications um, and I would encourage everybody to take in, you know, take that step once they've done level one. I appreciate it can be a bit daunting but everybody that's done it with us has thoroughly enjoyed it over the last kind of 20 odd years so do, do look into that. Um, what you're actually effectively trying to do is prevent as far as is possible contaminated food going into the food chain, food traceability and all the rest of it. Um, and the, Alex asked me, he, he said, you know, a lot of people kind of think, well, well, what do we do if we find something wrong? Um, what's the process? Well, if you suspect, and I, I, I mean suspect, um, you, cannot be com you cannot be confident that just because you've seen inflamed lymph nodes that it is TB, it could be lots and lots of things, but you have to assume it is because that's an indicating factor of TB, for example. So... What do you do? Well, stop messing around with a carcass, first of all, and you need to report it. A notifiable disease, by definition, is something that must be reported. Who do you report it to? AFA, uh, Animal, Plant and Health Agency. The people involved, for, or the people that you've reported this to over the years has changed. Um, you know, if, if effectively, we are contacting the what used to be the old environmental health services in old money. Um, now it's AFA. Um, work out of your local authority, Animal Plant and Health Agency. Uh, and basically um, you contact them, let them know what you've got and take instructions from them. It's sort of simply. So basically don't bury your head in the sand or run away and pretending you've not found anything or panic and bury it, whatever. It's quite straightforward. Contact the people at AFA and get advice, explain what you've got, and you know they will then tell you what to do. Clearly, you don't want to be dragging contamination halfway around the countryside. You don't know what you're dealing with. And for example, in the case of foot and mouth, highly contagious, the last thing you want to be doing, if you've got a potential foot and mouth scenario, is both you and the contaminated can potentially contaminated carcass being dragged halfway across, for example, in my case, South Asia, um, what we need to do is contain that. Um, and the notifiable diseases, there'll be a different kind of process and a different procedure. So in the case of TB, for example, in a row, let's say, for example, so you've found an inflamed, very inflamed lymph node, you've examined the carcass, so you've got a suspicion of TB. Now, the most sensible thing to do is to recover that carcass back to a clean environment, which is the larder and home, and by, by, in my case, that would be putting the whole thing into a row sack, carrying it back to the larder. Or you can get a vehicle, an ATV or the truck to the car, then a clean plastic tray, you know, clean disposable tray into the truck, back to the car, get onto the phone, speak to the people and say, right, this is what I've got. And in the two cases that I've actually found potential um, TB, um, they actually came out to me pretty quickly. 
Um, interestingly, the row was shot within uh, probably about three or four hundred yards of each other, three years apart. Both were young roebuck. In both cases, there was obviously something wrong with the buck when I when I first saw it. Uh, and when I shot it and opened the carcass up, I didn't have to go very far and it wasn't an in-depth examination because in both cases it were pretty obvious that there was something drastically wrong. Uh, in one case it was horrible. The whole thing was infected inside. As soon as I started to open up the pelvic area, it was absolutely covered in pus. I didn't even have to start looking at lymph nodes, to be honest. I'd have struggled to find them. It was that messy. It was horrible. Um, interestingly, in both cases, um, the, 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 it's the same chap that came out from South Asia um, actually took the carcass away, they culture it for TB, uh, it took about six weeks I think and then and then they got back in touch with me and, and advised me that it wasn't TB. They don't tell you what it is because they don't have the facilities or resources I suppose to go into an in-depth post-mortem examination and bear in mind this is six weeks down the road but what they do tell me, what they did tell me was that it wasn't TB. Um, they both came, they, they came out straight away in both instances they were fascinated with the level of knowledge that, that I had as a, as a level two stoker. I mean, I'm an assessor, but never mind, a level two stoker. Um, they were fascinated at that level of knowledge. And one guy was here probably talking to me for two and a half hours about it. So they will come. They are interested. Um, what concerns me greatly is that that's the only time that this guy, and he's been working in Asia for goodness knows how many years, had been called out to a deer with uh, that had um, inflamed lymph nodes and therefore suspected TB. So that, that raises a bit of a question. I can't believe that there hasn't been any other instance of somebody finding a carcass with inflamed lymph nodes in Asia in the last sort of 16 years. But anyway, there you go, that's an aside. So basically, uh, don't panic, don't bury your head in the sand, don't run away screaming, just follow the process and the process is straight, straightforward. Get on the phone, contact the people at AFA, and take instructions. So, there you go. Love the questions. Do keep them coming in. We've got a whole list now of stuff that we want to answer and tackle, and we'll tackle it, you know, as we get around to it. Um, I think the next thing I'm going to talk about probably next week, we're just going to have a look at early does. I mean, we're coming into the doe season now. A lot of people are asking me, well, how do you start? Where do you start? I mean, which deer do you start to select and, and shoot and all the rest of it? So I'll cover what, what our philosophy at South Asia Stalking is about handling and dealing with um, the, the cool data in the early days of the doe season. So again, lots of you have asked that, so we'll cover it. So as always, thanks for watching. Watching, Please subscribe. And if you know you've got mates that stalk or anybody that's interested, please give them a chivvy up and a shove and tell them to have a look at the thing, have a look at OT. Uh, and subscribe because I say that helps us, that helps us get the support to keep bringing you the shows. And I think uh, might even have Rob back next week. I don't know if he condescends to make a long drive back from from uh, Argyle back to Sunny Ayrshire, but I don't know. He might be setting up home down there, not sure. So, um, as always, good night from me, good night from him in Argyle, and as always, keep watching. Thanks. <laughs>